Hello, and welcome to another episode of Todd Talks and Todd Talks People Listen. How about they? Today is a death battle many years in the making and many years in the wanting. Because today we have two princes, technically kings, uh, of battle who are going to go up against one another for the first time. Yes, I said the first time. I don't count the DVX. It was really bad. And to me. To me. We were talking, of course, about Thor versus Vegeta. A matchup that just honestly speaks for itself. These are two very prideful, sometimes egotistical, sometimes sometimes <laughs> egotistical, uh, guys who love to fight, love to get stronger, and yet have a noble streak within them when it suits them. So, shall we begin? First up, we have Thor. Now, ironically, we've already talked about Thor via Thor versus Wonder Woman, a fight that I called. And things have changed, but let's start with the basics. Thor is, of course, the prince of Asgard and son of Odin and Gaia. Sorry, son of uh, Odin and the Phoenix Force. Why not? It's, it's a thing. It's happening right now. Anyway... Uh, as the prince of Asgard, uh, Thor was raised to not just be a god, but to be the breaker of the cycle of Ragnarok. If you recall Thor Wonder Woman, every like 5,000 years or so, the Norse gods go through a Ragnarok where they all die and then get reborn with only vague memories of what came before. Thor was trained and raised and slightly manipulated by Odin, slightly, but uh, to break this cycle, and he eventually did this, but this helped make him one of the strongest guards of all of Asgard. This is before the Phoenix Force or the Volation. So, due to this, he has been fighting all sorts of beings across all sorts of realms for millennia, all right? Uh, I don't know his exact age, but it's, it, he's, he's old, all right? He's old. So, but the key thing here is that because of how he was raised and because of his own innate personality, he was a very prideful and arrogant fool. And he was a very strong fool, but he was a very prideful fool. And because of this, Odin decided to punish him by uh, casting him out of Asgard into, onto Earth so that he could learn a bit of humility. Thank the gods, he did, and became not only one of Earth's mightiest heroes via the Avengers, but became a champion across the Nine Realms. And this was important because there's always something going on in the Nine Realms. Can we just be honest here? This is this is Marvel Comics. There's always something going on. And because of that, he has fought Frost Giants. He has fought demons. He has fought witches and, um, so and wizards and uh, various galactic entities. He's fought Celestials. I'll get to them in a bit. Um, he's fought his own brother multiple times. He's fought his own father multiple times. He fought his father's brother, and he died. But he, he killed the guy first, so, yeah. Uh, what? It's Marvel. They always come back. They always come back. Anyway, so he has, like, tons of experience fighting the highest caliber of enemies. And part of this is because not only because of his innate godly power, but because of the best hammer ever, MC Hammer. I'm kidding. Um, you'll near MC Hammer is a close second. Can't touch this. Da, 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 da. And uh, but um, Mjolnir, who was which was forged by harnessing the power of a god storm. Don't even get me started on that. And forging it through a dying star, which exploded, killed the dinosaurs. Oops. Uh, the hammer is made of Uru, which is technically a moon rock, which is why Moon Knight was able to use it once. Look it up. And, uh, no, I haven't seen Moon Knight, no spoilers in the commentary. Uh, comments, whatever. So, uh, but anyway, it, it's made from a super hard board named called Uru, which is very hard to destroy, but, and it hits like a mother effer, okay? This thing is able to not just travel fast on its own, but deliver blows that will rock the Hulk, Thanos, uh, Gore the God Butcher, more on him later, um, Loki, Odin, and just about anyone you, you, can think of it's hurt all right it's that darn strong and uh, as noted in the uh, previous death battle with thor it can go dang fast thor winds it up and hurls it and when he does he can travel way faster than light they calculated at the time 
that he can go about 500,000 times the speed of light. And technically, I think it's faster because if you recall what happened with the Ghost Rider, but the, that's another story. And we still got another power-up to talk about a little bit later. But that's not the only weapon that Thor has. And as proven via the uh, preview, which I have not seen, but I saw a, a teaser, uh, a still image of it, they are going to finally give him Jarnjavorn, or however the heck you say that axe. Axe. Okay? Axe. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not saying that Thor wouldn't name his butt. But anyway, uh, Jarnjavorn was actually Thor's original weapon. It was an axe that was uh, crafted by dwarves, so thus very, very powerful. And after some, let's just call it time manipulation by Kang the Conqueror, uh, Thor got so ticked off by a celestial that he blessed the axe with his own blood, for real, and made it so that the axe would not just be indestructible, it could kill celestials, and that's exactly what it did, twice. And then when Thor became unworthy because of Gore the God Butcher, this is when the mighty Thor with Jane Foster came into play, uh, he used Jarnjaborn as his main weapon. So, yeah, it's a uh, nigh unstoppable axe that is stated to cut through virtually anything, including the gods known as Celestials, which even the Avengers, without Thor, have an incredibly hard time dealing with. And even with Thor, they are incredibly powerful. So, uh, but that still only grazes the top, believe it or not, of all he can do. Even I was surprised by all of Thor's abilities when I re-examined uh, him. He has not only the ability to manipulate the weather, summon lightning and uh, thunder, and can, he can manipulate the Earth, and because of his Phoenix Force heritage now, he can manipulate cosmic fire. Okay. And I, I would, I'm sorry, uh, this Phoenix Force thing? Not a fan, okay? I mean, like, this is one of those things where, you know, comics goes like, hey, how can we change up Thor? What if his mother wasn't Gaia? Okay, so who did Odin sleep around with? Because we've already established Odin's a playboy. You can look at Angela. That's his daughter, not his lover. Thank God. Um, but hey, what if we what if we already did the one, bill, 1 million BC Avengers. Why don't we just have him, you know, <laughs> go and hook up with the Phoenix Force? What could possibly go wrong? Uh, anyway, so uh, he can be a fire. He, and then his... Through Mjolnir, he can actually absorb energy and send it back to sender. And he's used this multiple times against very powerful beings, including absorbing the God Bomb, which was supposed to uh, wipe out all godly life in the universe and possibly the multiverse. So, again, Gold the Gold Butcher, for you, those who remember the Death Valley bloopers. Uh, so, yeah, he can do that. He can also apparently mess with your soul. <laughs> I had no idea. And actually absorb your life force. He, he did this to an enemy known as the Presence. And Presence, not Presence. Okay. And uh, he almost absorbed the life energy to an extent that it left the Presence a lifeless husk. Almost. They eventually begged Thor to stop. And he did. So, yeah. He's got incredible power. And... This still doesn't talk about a couple of his power-ups, but we'll, I'm going to still hold off on that for just right now. Because it also should be noted that because of the belt of strength that he wears, a standard equipment, and they'll totally give it to him, uh, his strength is magnified tenfold. His stamina is legendary, like truly godly stamina. He cannot tire out. Or if he can't, it takes an incredible amount. He was tortured for 17 days by Gore the God Butcher. Did not break. He fought for two years, non-stop, and did not tire. And that was before the belt of strength, which increases uh, stamina and strength. So, yeah. He, 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 can, he can go the distance, ladies. Thor can go the distance. And he has with many, many partners. <laughs> he, has, he has children in the future, I'm just saying. Uh, well, one of them. So, uh, and, the, and so now let's talk about his two important power-ups. One of which you already know about, which is the Warrior's Madness. It makes it so that he loses some mental capabilities, but he is ten times stronger, which is bad for just about anyone who, uh, who goes up against him. The second one, though, is one that I cannot confirm will be in this death battle, but based on recent comics uh, and the time spent away from uh, Thor Wonder Woman, which was three seasons ago... Um, He's going to get the Odin Force. The Odin Force is the massively cosmic power that was uh, only given to the Allfather of Asgard. So usually it's Odin, hence Odin Force. But multiple times, including currently in the comics, like as of February of this year, um, the Odin Force 
is has been given to Thor because Thor is the All Father. In fact, he's been All Father at least two or three times in comic continuity, and each time when Thor has this power, it is insane. In fact, it's specifically stated that the upper limits of the Odin Force are not known, and because of that, uh, it's really hard to talk about because it, you don't know how just how big it can be. We do know that when Odin wielded it, he was able to rewrite galaxies, wipe them out of existence, and bring them back because he could. Thor, under the uh, Odin Force influence, once said, I can merely wipe you from existence with it. And he did that. Uh, in fact, in one uh, alternate timeline, Thor actually got corrupted by the Odin Force and took over Earth, rendering it an Asgardian territory and ruled of the Iron Fist. But eventually, through the Odin Force, present Thor, not the future Thor, uh, went back in time, because he'd do that with Odin Force, and rewrote history so that it wouldn't happen. So, yeah. And that's not talking about not just the increase the power to speed and durability that the Odin Force would give him, but he, acts, he gets incredible abilities, not just time travel, but uh, dimensional travel. He actually transported, uh, I think it was all of New York City, or maybe it was the Earth. No, I think it was New York City. He transported all of denizens of New York City to another dimension to avoid an attack. That's a lot. That's like millions upon millions of people. And he did that with the Odin Force. The catch with the Odin Force is that if you... Think of it like a battery. It has a limit, and it can be recharged, but it can only be recharged at a certain rate. And thus, if you use it faster than you recharge it, you're going to go into something called the Odin Sleep, which happens to Odin... Uh, has happened to Odin many times in the comics, and and has happened to Thor once in the comics. And another time, uh, Odin used it so much that he actually got rid of it multiple times, including to reforge Mjolnir because he wanted his hammer back. Aww. Uh, other weaknesses to Thor is that he is at times an incredibly arrogant individual. He he does think at times he's almost too strong. I am too strong. Remember Titan Dreyfus. Uh, but he has gotten better at it and has become uh, not just a worthy all-father, but a loyal friend in the Avengers, a loyal uh, person to uh, his closest circle. And he's someone that they count on a lot. And while I may not be the biggest fan of Thor Ragnarok and maybe Love and Thunder, depending on what happens, it's, it's saying something that he is like one of the best comic characters. And especially in recent times with writers like Jason Aaron, they've crept such incredible stories, and yeah, it's pretty cool. Also, he was a Herald of Galactus. It happened. Yeah. Moving on. We now go to Prince Vegeta, a guy who actually has not been in death battle, has not been in death battle since uh, him versus Shadow, which was a season one, I think. Season one or two. And so we got a lot to cover, since I have never covered him before. So, let me tell you about a planet called Vegeta, ruled by a king called Vegeta, who had a prince son named Vegeta. Such great names in the Saiyan race. I mean, Broly, Goku, Braddock. I used to always call him Bardock. It's Braddock. I don't know why. Um, so, yeah, uh, the Saiyan race was basically one of the greater conquerors of the Dragon Ball universe. And because of this, they were eventually conscripted to be in the army of King Cold and his son Frieza, who I actually thought was a girl for a long time. My bad. Uh, I was a kid. I heard a, I heard the high pitched voice. Like, oh, that's a that's a woman. Not that I care. That just means women, women can be bosses. Why can't why can't women rule the universe? Right, Beyonce. So <laughs> I'm going off with so many references today. Uh, it's not intentional. I promise you. Anyway, so under the purview of Frieza. The Saiyans went and conquered world after world after world after world after world. But then eventually, Frieza got the idea to go and um, just destroy the Saiyans. Because she... Say, dang, I said she. Uh, Frieza heard that one of them might be able to defeat her. Dang, I said her again. Uh, see, now this guy's stuck in my head. Might be able to defeat him. Um, this is only one part of the canon. I'll get to the other later. But, so, Frieza destroys the planet, and only a handful of Saiyans remain. One of which, of course, is Goku, and the other was Vegeta. And Vegeta was not happy with Frieza for doing this. So, even though Vegeta served under Frieza for years, he secretly plotted to overthrow the ruler. And after his conflicts with Goku, and the start of the Namek arc, or Frieza arc, uh, he eventually became more and more powerful and through some magic of anime storytelling became a part of the Z Fighters. Sure. 
Oh, he also married Bulma, which I still to this day do not understand. I mean, I know they explained it with the whole, Saiyans are attracted to strong women. I do not know that, Kakarot. I should have a bad Vegeta impression. Kakarot! So, uh, yeah, he had Trunks, which is also a great character, which we should totally also get in Death Battle one day. But, um, again, DBX doesn't count. So, Vegeta eventually got stronger and stronger and stronger, of course, achieve, achieving the rank of Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 2, and through the Super Arcs, became a Super Saiyan God. And then Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan, a.k.a. Super Saiyan Blue. And so, right there, should have been it, right? Well, no, not exactly, because over time, Vegeta not only became one of their best fighters, he became one of the more consistent fighters, too put up against some of the greater rivals that they faced, including Frieza and Cell and the androids and Majin Buu and, uh, uh, crap, <laughs> oh, Beerus and Golden Frieza and eventually the Tournament of Power. So his attacks are all based on key. He is a kind of life energy, and he can manipulate it in various ways, including with his iconic Gallic gun or the final flash and uh, his finger point laser and so on and so forth. He has a wider range of these attacks that he can do at various distances, and it's incredible to watch at times. I mean, it's anime, so of course it looks good. I'm just saying. But we're still not done, because via the super manga and the super anime, get it, Dragon Ball Super, Super Man, whatever, uh, super manga, uh, Vegeta has even more power, because uh, which one do I want to talk about first? Let's start with the Super or the Tournament of Power or Universal Tournament Arc. I always call it the Tournament of Power for some reason. Again, don't know why. Uh, in the Universal Tournament Arc, Vegeta was put up against some of the greatest warriors across the multiverse of Dragon Ball, which is a thing, apparently. Uh, and you, and you, you won? Never mind. Uh, <laughs> so, one of these were the uh, Pride Troopers, and they were indeed some of the stronger fighters in the tournament. And uh, one of them pushed Vegeta to beyond Super Saiyan Blue. He became Super Saiyan Blue Evolved, which I like to call it the Shining Blue because his hair grew an even lighter shade of blue. And so it's been not proven, but referenced to be kind of like a Kaioken. So he can get about an extra 20 times boost. But that still wasn't the end because in the manga he gained two new abilities, two very important abilities. One was spirit control. If you recall, after the Frieza arc, we learned that Goku uh, managed to get off of planet Namek and ended up on a planet, I'm not gonna try and say its name, and learned spirit control, which was a special way of manipulating energies. And through this, he learned instant transmission, okay? Vegeta in the manga, after the Universal Tournament arc, went to that planet and learned spirit control himself but he used it in a couple different ways one he used it to magnify his own power so in one context he used a finger beam which should have been like you know a short little laser and it turned into a massive explosion of a blast cool but then he also learned spirit fission that's f-i-s-s-i-o-n and through that he is able to separate energies within beings uh there was a arc called moro the prisoner and moro's shtick if you for lack of a better term was that he would copy and take energy from other beings he actually drained the life out of people and put it into his own and even at one point became the earth itself anime manga um so using spirit fission vegeta was able to uh separate and take back some of the energy that uh, Moro had stolen and actually return it to uh, its original owners. And he even said to uh, Piccolo at one point, if he wanted to, he could use Spirit Fission to actually undo the fusions that uh, Piccolo had undergone. If you recall, Piccolo can fuse with other Namekians. Uh, he, Vegeta said he could actually undo that with spirit fission, which is crazy to think about. There are limitations, including how you can do it. You, you can do it at distance or you can do it up close. And it's a little vague about what kinds of energies can be separated because he did it with Moro because those were stolen energy. So those energies that were not his own. Whether you can give to gifted energies or something else, it's a little vague. And a uh, little vague. There's your, there's your Dragon Ball moniker. Dragon Ball, little vague. 
Um, but the second one is also the one that came in the manga, and this is the one that we are definitely going to get in this death battle. It's Ultra Ego. So, in Dragon Ball Super, Goku obtained a super form, what is known as Ultra Instinct. Basically, his body becomes a living reflex muscle, and it allows him to react at super fast speeds and go up against some of the tougher enemies by not just boosting his power, but making sure that their attacks do not hit him. Vegeta, naturally, was PO'd about this because he's like, how did Goku get another super form and not me? I should really be a Vegeta voice actor. Um, um, so Vegeta was ticked about this and tried to become Ultra Instinct himself. You might actually remember this in the anime. Uh, naturally, it didn't work. And so after training with Beerus, he realized that there was no way he would learn Ultra Instinct. His nature, his Saiyan nature... Uh, remember, Goku was raised as a human, um, would not allow him to do it. So Beerus told him the truth. There's another way. There is another power-up for you should you want it. And it's called Ultra Ego, basically. This is when gods of destruction, which Vegeta refused to be in, in certain ways, uh, embrace their chaotic nature, embrace their destructiveness, and get a level of a power, uh, sorry, level of power and ability to go beyond um, what they are and just revel in the destruction that they cause. All right, and uh, this is when one of the bigger twists of Dragon Ball came out. Remember what I said about Frieza and how uh, Frieza destroyed uh, the planet Vegeta because they found out about the potential Super Saiyan? That wasn't exactly true. Apparently, Beerus was the one to tell Frieza to blow up the planet. Because remember, as a god of destruction, he had to try and balance the amount of planets that were out there. So yeah, uh, and he basically said, Do you really think I care about that, Vegeta? I blew up and keep kept going on with my day. So yeah, um, but through his training and then going uh, up against a villain, also from the manga, called Granola, from the planet Serial. <laughs> I know it's a food thing with this show, but, like, seriously, stop it. Get some help. But anyway, after fighting Granola, he was able to go beyond Super Saiyan... Sorry, Super Saiyan Blue Evolved. Super Saiyan God Blue Evolved. Ugh. I was called Shining Blue. Uh, he was able to go beyond Shining Blue and attained Ultra Ego. He gets purple hair, enhanced strength, but with a few key twists. Mainly... Because of his destructive nature, which even Vegeta admits he loved being in that form. He got to embrace his Saiyan-ness, if you will. Um, he could grow in power just by his love of battle and by taking damage. Yes, the more he got hit by Granola, he got stronger and even faster to an extent. And this made him incredibly hard to put down. But because of... Uh, at least at present in the manga, his unmastered state of Ultra Ego, not unlike Goku with Ultra Instinct, there are limitations, not the least of which is that there's a limit to what your body can take. And Vegeta knows this better than anybody because he's been beaten down by so many bad guys in this, in this series. Um, but because of how much he loved the battle, he was actually letting himself get hit too much. And eventually Granola was able to put him down for a little bit, and then uh, other things happened. The arc's not fully done. So, Ultra Ego is powerful, but it does have limits. And if we're really going to talk about uh, Vegeta weaknesses, we got to talk about his gosh dang Saiyan pride. All right. Vegeta is the most arrogant, one of the most arrogant anime characters and manga characters you are ever going to see. All right. He thinks he's better than everyone. He does things to prove he's better than everyone. And even though he's married and has kids too, um, he's not exactly the best husband and father. You know, he doesn't want to do things with Bulma, but he does them because he knows it'll make her happy. And he's like, I can put up with it. You know, he'd rather be training. And then every time Goku achieves a new level of power, he d loses it. He straight up freaks. He's like, I've got to get better than Kakarot. Uh, which, including one of his biggest betrayals in the Majin Buu saga, when he got the mark from Bobby to get stronger because he learned about Super Saiyan 3. He betrayed his own friends, family, loved ones, whatever, to get back at Goku. 
And then if you remember Resurrection F, he straight up beat Golden Frieza. He got his revenge, but because of his pride, he decided to gloat. Don't come back this time, you know. And then slowly wound his uh, energy up to destroy him, uh, destroy Frieza. And that caused the destruction of the Earth because Frieza used that momentary lapse in judgment and time to straight up blow up the planet. So if it wasn't for Whis, the show would be over. And uh, he also, if you recall, uh, had one, uh, what was it? it was Fused Cell? Or one of the versions of Cell, the not perfect Cell, the one right below. He had that version of Cell beat cold. He was gonna win, easy. And then he's like, oh, I can, I want to see you fight in your perfect form, Cell. What could possibly go wrong? And so he willingly let Cell absorb Android 18, which would cause perfect Cell, which he could not beat. And then Goku could not beat. And then Go Gohan beat, but with Goku and Vegeta's help. Anyway, he gets in his own way all the gosh dang time, and including with Ultra Ego, as I just noted. So while he has gotten better and he does have a noble side, he has become a, a reliant Z fighter. He is. So dang arrogant. So, yeah. Alright, now. Who wins between Thor and Vegeta? Especially when we include, which we know they're going to have in the death battle, Ultra Ego and Spirit Fission and everything else. I'll admit that because of how Dragon Ball works, and they've had this with every single Dragon Ball character, because of how it works, the scaling matters. And... Based on scaling, you could argue, you could argue that Vegeta, especially in Ultra Ego, is stronger than Thor. You could argue it. Whether it's actually true is debatable at best. All right, and that's just because again, Dragon Ball, a little vague. So here's the thing. I don't know how fast Vegeta is, and I actually rewatched Hulk Broly, and they said that Hulk was actually a little faster than Broly, which is really interesting when you think about it. Um, and we know that Thor is faster than Hulk, so by that logic, Hulk, or sorry, Thor is faster than Broly, who was able to keep up with Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta, who was millions of times, potentially, better than uh, the sum of its parts, which is Goku and Vegeta. So that already puts an interesting spin on things. The second thing is, um, how do I want to put this? Not power output, but power ability. You could argue that Vegeta has more attacks than Thor because of his various key abilities and Spirit Fission and uh, Ultra Ego and with the transformations and all that. But Thor is no slouch. He has, you know, elemental manipulation. He can actually manipulate matter. He can, uh, uh, teleport he can um he and then of course mjolnir he technically has two different ways to attack he's gonna have jarjaborn in the death battle so that's two weapons that he can use and whatever and, and so on and so forth so that that's not what i'm really worried about the real question is who have they actually beaten that is on their top tier the best opponents that vegeta has actually beaten definitively was golden frieza when Frieza was still unrefined. This is again early. He, even he admitted that uh, Frieza rushed after getting Golden Frieza because they thought uh, Frieza thought he could beat Vegeta and Goku. He was wrong because he burned out too quickly. Um, so, he, but he did beat Top in the Universal Tournament saga, and Top was a god of destruction, right? Technically, much like Vegeta and Ultra Ego or Frieza in Golden form. Top wasn't unrefined. He was being trained to be a god of destruction, but he was not as powerful as, say, a Beerus or even his own universe, his god of destruction. Uh, and he was, even in god of destruction form, he wasn't as strong as Jiren, who was insanely strong. We all know we're going to get him in death battle eventually. So that's another fact here. While as Thor has defeated gods who... Uh, gods and beings that could destroy galaxies and potentially universes. He's fought his own father. He has fought various celestials and killed celestials. He actually got out, or sorry, uh, Galactus in one of his forms to actually run away from him because of the power that he exuded. And this is not including the Odin Force, which makes him capable of wiping out galaxies and potentially universes all on his own. And because of Jarjaborn, which can cut through almost anything, we know that it could very easily cut through Vegeta because while he is a Saiyan, he is humanoid. 
all right? Yes, he has... He could probably uh, pause the attack, like catch the axe, but if that hits him, it's going to cut it off his arm. If for no other reason, that it actually cut off Thor's arm once. Believe it. Um, the other thing here is, while well, you could say, but what about Ultra Ego? Ultra Ego's upper limits are not defined, not unlike Ultra Instinct. And even Ultra Instinct has been able to get... Uh, overwhelmed by stronger opponents like with the granola arc and technically even moro uh the more of the prisoner so that is not a guarantee and thor especially with the odin force or even as a herald of galactus has power cosmic and universal all right and as noted before uh with the odin force he could travel back in time do dimensional portals and whatever so he could actually throw Vegeta into another dimension and the battle would be over. Or he could travel back in time. Time, huh? And uh, figure out a way to kill Vegeta before he transforms not unlike Green Lantern Ben 10. And because of Ultra Ego's inherent weakness, which Vegeta would totally revel in because he did that with Granola, he would take the hits from Thor because he would think, oh, that's just going to make me stronger. And then he's slowly going to get whittled down and overwhelmed. Vegeta will be a good opponent for Thor, no doubt, but based on everything, and it's like, and again, there is going to be a scaling fight in the comments. I, I totally understand that. It's, it's the same thing with Hulk Broly. But even if he was faster than Thor, which I'm not sure he is, or, or stronger than Thor, which I'm not sure he is, Thor can totally kill Vegeta. He Vegeta has been overwhelmed by lesser opponents, and uh, and has been overwhelmed by stronger opponents who theoretically should not have been as strong as him based on what the power levels that he had or yes I know power levels are not a good register but I'm just I'm just stating it all right again he almost lost to top he did lose to Jiren despite his uh shining blue form and even with ultra ego he lost to granola without much issue so what he could and then Thor has fought gods and destroyers before. Remember Gore the God Butcher? His whole shtick was he spent years upon years upon years going across the universe, killing all sorts of gods, destroyer gods, gods of power, gods of fear, gods of death. And Gore killed all of them. And then because of Thor, he finally lost. But even then it was he had Thor needed a lot of help, including three different versions of himself, one of which had the Odin Force. And he was finally able to uh, defeat Granola. So, in spite of all of that, or in spite of all the difficulties that Thor has had, Thor has more consistent victories, more powers, more hexes. He can definitely take on Ultra Ego. And Vegeta's own pride would leave him more than open to some deadly blows more times than not, whether it be by Mjolnir, uh, Jarnjaborn, the Odin Force, or something in between. And for the love of all that's holy, if any of you say that Vegeta could lift Mjolnir, you really need to get some help. I saw someone saying it in the Death Battle forum comments. There is no gosh dang chance that Vegeta could lift Mjolnir. He is way too arrogant. All right. <clears throat> so with that, I am picking Thor to beat Vegeta in this Death Battle. And with that, I am ending this episode of Talk Talk. Who do you think is going to win between Thor and Vegeta? How fun do you think the sprite fight is going to be and what do you think the final blow is going to be let me know in the comments below so i thank you for watching if you made it as far i know you were listening and i'll see you around